All right, I think we should get, should we get started. We're going to get started now. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Sage Weil. Uh, this is Loic uh, Dakery, and we're going to talk about Ceph today. Um, so we're going to sort of split it into sort of two sections. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ceph, um, just high-level background, what it is, what it does. I'll talk a bit about the current release um, and what's new and what's there. And then I'll talk about Hammer, which is coming up. It's going to be released next month um, and what's new in that version. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about all the different integrations um, of Ceph into other projects um, and how other ways that you can use it. Um, so first, um, a high-level diagram just to sort of give you an overview of what Ceph is and what it does. So Ceph is a scalable distributed storage system with lots of different interfaces that let you put data in it. Um, so at the lowest level in red, that's very difficult to read, um, is Rados which is the, the scalable distributed object layer that is responsible for storing all of the data that you put into Ceph. Um, it's designed to be elastic, scalable. It's the part that makes sure that your data is stored on multiple nodes. If a node fails, it'll get replicated and recovered. And all that stuff is sort of seamlessly handled by this layer, gives, providing a sort of a nice, clean API that you build other services on top of. Um, Liberados is a library that lets you access that sort of at the lowest level. It's got bindings in lots of different languages. Um, more than probably you really need. Um, and then we have sort of three main ways that you, um, services that we build on top of that. Um, there's the Rados Gateway, which gives you a RESTful object storage interface. So similar to Amazon S3, which is sort of the API that we're targeting um, for compatibility and feature set and all that. Um, and also um, OpenStack Swift, we have basic compatibility with the Swift API. So you can sort of drop in Ceph in place of either of those, those services or software packages. There's the Rados Block Device, which gives you a virtual disk abstraction. Um, so think sort of equivalent to iSCSI, but highly available and distributed. Um, so it gives you virtual block devices that you can map either using um, a recent Linux kernel. It'll show up as dev RBD0. Um, or it can link directly into KVM so that the virtual machine is talking on the back end to the distributed storage cluster to provide a virtual disk to your virtual machine. Um, and it supports uh, um, copy and write snapshots and cloning and all sorts of um, nifty stuff. And then finally, there's a distributed file system called CephFS that gives you POSIX semantics that's fully scale out distributed and that's also built on top of Rados. Um, also, there's also a native client for the Linux kernel, so you can mount dash T Ceph and get sort of a native mount um, using the native protocols um, with strong consistency and scalability. And there's also a Fuse client. Um, and then there's a library that we can link into other projects like Samba or um, Ganesha so that you can re-export CephFS via traditional legacy protocols like um, SIFS and NFS. Um, but all that collectively we refer to as, as the Ceph storage system. Um, the way that Ceph is typically deployed, um, it's designed to be run on commodity hardware. Um, that's designed sort of to fail. Um, so inside each node, typically, you have a bunch of disks. Um, they have a local file system on top, um, usually XFS, although you can also use ButterFS or X4. And then on top of that, there's the local object storage daemon, which is sort of the Ceph smarts that manages the replication and distribution of data. Um, and the idea is then you have a whole bunch of these servers that are, you know, just racks and racks of them, scale out in a data center, and you build these huge clusters, um, you know, to tens of petabytes or more. Um, there are also a small number of monitor nodes that are responsible just for keeping track of who's participating in the cluster and whether they're up or down to sort of provide some consensus. Um, but the basic sort of idea with Ceph is to push as much intelligence into this storage daemon so that it can sort of do things in a very scalable, distributed um, fashion without any single points of failure. Um, and then the monitor has sort of the very minimal coordination to make sure that all works. And these are, just, these are all just user level daemons that can run on any host. Um, in a large cluster, you'll sort of have de dedicated monitor nodes. Um, but in a small cluster of less than you know, 50 nodes or something, they'll just be daemons running on the same, on the same hosts. Um, so sort of at a high level, the, the sort of the key things that Rados provides you um, is fault tolerance. So any node in the system can fail, whether it's a monitor or a disk or anything. Um, as clusters scale up, failure is inevitable. We need to deal with it. Um, this, this cluster is designed to be self-healing. So if a node f fails, the cluster automatically detects that and routes traffic around it. And if it's been down for long enough, it's not going to just reboot. Then it'll start migrating data so that you have sort of have the number of replicas of the data that you want. There's also background scrubbing, so you can detect um, bit rot if that happens, um, and it'll sort of 
repair around that. Um, the cluster is designed to be elastic, so you might start out deploying a cluster of 10 nodes, and then you decide that you are going to add, add new nodes as time goes on, or maybe you'll even remove nodes from the cluster. And the system will always sort of re automatically, in the background, rebalance and distribute your data so that it's always sort of using all the available nodes that you have um, for you. Um, one of the sort of the key design tenets is that we are aiming for strong consistency at all times. So there are sort of two categories of distributed systems are the ones that aim for consistency. And if you don't have enough replicas or something is down, then they are simply not available. Um, you'll, your I.O. will block. And then there are the highly, or the, the eventual consistency ones that sort of let you always read and write, but you might not get the right answer. Um, Ceph is in the first camp. So we, that's necessary because we build block devices and file systems and things on top of that that require that, that consistency. Um, and so that's sort of always, always where we go. And then the last thing um, is that the, the way that Ceph distributes the data across all, the no all these nodes um, is using a hashing algorithm called Crush. And the idea is that clients can calculate which node to talk to. They can always sort of end up at the right place. Um, and the way that that data is distributed is infrastructure aware. So you can define policies that say, you know, I want three replicas of my data. I want those replicas to be in separate racks or maybe in separate data centers or in separate hosts or whatever it is that sort of um, works for your particular deployment. Um, so I'll, talk, I'll start by talking a little bit about Giant, which is the current stable release um, that the current generation of products tend to be based on. Um, so the, the sort of the key, the, the key new features in Giant um, are, are two things. Uh, there's um, support for, yay, LibreOffice is our favorite thing ever. Um, so the, the, the two key features in, in Giant are um, actually not even Giant in Firefly, which is actually what the, everything is based on. Sorry, um, the two key features are support for erasure coding and for cache sharing. Um, so I'll start with erasure coding. Um, traditionally, Ceph has supported replication, so you can do two, three, four, all the way up to 10 replicas of your data. Um, it's simple and it tends to perform well, um, but it uses a lot of disk space. Um, so we added a new type of pool in Rados called an erasure coded pool. Um, the idea here is that you can use a RAID-like code that stores a fraction of the additional space um, with some sort of performance trade-off. Um, so instead of having like a 200% overhead, you'll have like a 20% overhead or a 30% overhead. Um, it's a, there's a pluggable backend um, using JErasure or there's an Intel native library or there's a trivial XOR library. So you can use whatever erasure coding algorithm you want, whether it's Reed Solomon or Cauchy, whatever it is, it um, doesn't really matter. You can choose it when you create the pool. Um, and so it gives, you, it gives you much better storage efficiency and it's much better suited for um, colder data or archival data. Um, we have um, a set of um, slides that, let, that sort of demonstrate um, with actual people how erasure coding works that we can do if people want. Do people, people know, are people familiar with how RAID codes work or erasure coding? Do we want more information? One. Or? Yeah. Yes. Two. Two. Yeah. All right. Three. All right. Well, we can, we can come back to that at the end, I think, if we want, if we want to do that. Um, but the basic idea is that instead of having entire copies, you store just a little bit of extra data, and as long as you have, you know, you know, seven eighths or whatever of your data, then you can always recover it. Um, the second key feature that we added in Firefly um, is cache tiering. Um, so the basic idea here is that um, instead of having sort of a single pool of all your data um, with, on the same type of storage device um, that has all your hot and your cold data sort of mixed together, you can create a second um, Rados tier or pool that um, has only your hot data. Um, and you can back it by a different set of storage devices. So you can say all of, you have a bunch of SSD only nodes that have sort of, maybe it's only 10% of your cluster that has most of the hot data on it. And SEP will automatically manage the migration of the hot data to the cache tier. And as that data gets colder, it'll push it back down into the archival tier. And one of the key things um, that you can do with this, and the reason why we added it at the same time as erasure coding, um, is because erasure codes are really bad at doing small updates um, on, on large data objects, because um, they have to do a whole stripe rewrite, and it's, it just sucks. Um, and so you can combine the two features so that you use erasure coding for all your cold data um, behind the cache tier, and then your cache tier is replicated on SSDs or something like that. And so you get sort of the best of both worlds. Um, so that's all, that's all part of the current version of Ceph that you could be running today. How many people actually um, are running Ceph or are familiar with? All right, okay. So, so quite a few, few people are, are familiar with this. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hammer, which is the, the next major version of Ceph that's being released. Um, 
we're just doing feature freeze on Monday, um, and it should be out in about a month and a half, something like that, whenever, we, whenever it's ready, whenever we stabilize it and are happy with it. Um, so the first sort of category of improvements are on the Rados block device, um, and there are a couple of main things. Um, one of them is that the, the locking, the image locking, is now sort of fully transparent and automatic. Um, the feature has actually been there for a long time, um, but nobody used it because it was sort of um, cooperative and opt-in. Um, and so I think there's one integrated solution that I know of that actually made use of all the locking stuff. Um, but the basic idea is that you don't want two virtual machines to try to mount the same file system because they'll step all over each other's toes. Um, and so the locking stuff is now automatic. One of them will get like an eBusy. Um, and when you, when you take over a lock, it'll fence that old, that old client out of the cluster so that you don't have to worry about the, that level of corruption. So that's all new. Um, there's also support for copy and read. So, um, Traditionally, or for a long time now, um, RBD has supported copy on write clones. So you can have um, like a master image of your um, operating system install, and you create a clone for each virtual machine that you spin up. Um, but the, the copying only happened when you wrote to a block. Um, so copy on read means that as soon as you read from it, it can sort of preemptively do that copy, which means that the eventual write will have a lower latency. And the read is done asynchronously. So it's sort of a, a net performance win um, for those workloads. Um, but the, the biggest thing is object maps, which um, is about this close to being ready to merge. I'm hoping that it'll sort of <laughs> uh, make it under the wire. Um, but the, the main thing there is that um, instead of sort of blindly striping a, a block device across objects, um, we keep track of which of those objects actually exist, um, which has a bunch of performance benefits um, for um, a variety of different scenarios. So the main thing is that in the cloning case, um, we can avoid sort of doing two IOs to determine whether or not we need to read from the parent as, as opposed to the child. Um, so for clones, the Things are, tend to be faster, especially on the read side. And there are also a couple operations that administrators notice tend to be really slow. Like if you delete a really big image, it just takes a long time, even if there's no data written to it. And things like resize, um, people notice that. Those, those problems will basically go away because we'll know which objects we need to look at and which ones we don't need to. Um, so that's a big improvement. There's also a whole ton of refactoring that went in, just cleaning up the way that we sort of orchestrate who's operating on the image at once. Um, that's laying the groundwork for Great groundwork for future features that we're going to work on, um, like multi-data center replication that's coming sort of further down the line. Um, so lots of good stuff there. Um, one of the big focuses, though, has just been on performance in the, in the lowest Rados layer in the object store that sort of underpins the entire cluster. Um, and the main thing here is that we want to be able to have um, clusters that are backed purely by SSDs, um, either sort of the traditional consumer grade ones or even PCI attached high-end stuff um, that sort of similar to what you're going to get a couple of years down the line when you have all these new fancy memory technologies. Um, but the, really, the main thing is that we want to improve the, the, high, the, the number of IAPs we can get out of a single device. Um, so there's a whole bunch of work that went into optimizing all the threading and locking and sharding and making sure that we had CPU affinity so that we don't do as many context switch when we're doing I.O. Lots of that stuff um, that showed a lot of improvements there. Um, there's also focusing on just the, the amount of latency on a single I.O. If you have a single I.O. sort of traversing the entire stack, um, optimizing that. And we've seen some really good improvements there. Um, as part of that, we refactored sort of the internal API that um, hides the way that sort of the backend storage is handled um, so that we can plug in new backends in the future and also make the current one sort of behave um, and perform better. Um, as we sort of look forward down the line, we're looking at um, people who are writing backends that are tuned to specific memory technologies um, or specific types of workloads um, that take advantage of either you know, special flash interfaces or you know, the crazy non-volatile RAM stuff that's coming. Um, so we want to lay all the groundwork for all that stuff to happen. Um, and the other exciting thing is that the, the network abstraction that Ceph uses, the messenger that's responsible for passing everything over the network, um, the current implementation is pretty old and it all, it's all uses a bazillion threads and it's not the most performant thing. We have two new implementations that have been merged. Um, there's a sort of a re-implementation of the existing protocol called async messenger um, that's in there now that's still sort of experimental but it's, it's has shows huge improvements as far as the, the latency that you see um, when when you start looking at these you know small IOs and high IOPS workloads and then there's an XIO messenger that's based um, that targets InfiniBand um, networking that's been contributed by Mellanox and cohort FS so that's also pretty exciting um, lots of stuff on the sort of I.O. hinting side. Um, so the, we have allocation hints that were sort of mostly in place but disabled because of bugs in old versions of um, Linux. Um, those are sort of finally enabled um, by default, um, which means that we can limit the amount of fragmentation you see on XFS. Um, for people who have run um, RBD 
Um, over time, you see that over the, the files tend to get really fragmented and performance sort of slowly degrades. Um, so the allocation hints will mitigate a lot of that. Um, there's also a whole bunch of hinting that's been added up and down the stack. Um, so internally, the, the OSDs are doing things like telling the underlying file systems when not to cache, so that, for example, replicas don't sort of pollute their cache with data that's never going to get read. Um, and then we've also added stuff throughout the Libretos and LibRBD protocols so that um, on the client side, all these hints get passed all the way down um, and we can improve things. So whether it's random and sequential I.O. or whether um, clients know that they aren't going to cache that data that actually propagates all the way down to the back-end file systems. Um, and makes things much better. Um, so lots of sort of small improvements being made there that, that take advantage of the new hinting. And then for um, the administrator, there's just a whole bunch of small stuff that's, that's making things better. Um, so one of the things that traditionally has been sort of annoying is when you, um, when you lose a disk, um, your cluster says that it's some percentage of your objects are degraded. Um, but also when you add a disk, it also says some percentage are degraded because it wasn't distinguishing between objects that need to be copied for um, redundancy and objects that need to be moved because it wants to put them in a different place. Um, that's all cleared up now, so you actually have a very clear distinction between data that the cluster wants to migrate and stuff that actually needs to get re-replicated because you have you know, two instead of three copies and you might need to be worried. Um, the, the stuff status reporting is just much easier to read and more detailed and, and happier for people who are doing that. Um, one of the, the common problems people have is in sort of managing the OSD utilization or the or diagnosing the, the variance in utilization across all their disks. So there's sort of a new command that, that gives you a very concise summary of, of um, how much space is being used on all your devices. So you can tell if there's something going wrong as far as, as, far as that goes. So um, that's helpful. Um, there's an OSD perf command that actually is old, but not very many people know about that I just want to call out. So you can tell if, there's a, if you have a large cluster and there are a small number of OSDs that have you know, disks that are on their way out or starting to fail and are just way slower than all the others, it makes it really easy to pick out those disks so you can you know, preemptively remove them from the cluster um, or figure out what's going on, that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll do a shout out to, to Calamari, which is the, the management API layer that, that we're building that sort of sits on top of Ceph that gives you RESTful APIs to administer everything. A whole lot of work has been going into Calamari to just um, to give you sort of a, a fully complete, robust set of, of APIs that manage all aspects of your Ceph cluster. Um, and that, that work continues um, and with each release. Um, so that's sort of high level Ceph in a nutshell. Um, we're then going to talk about um, all the ways that you can consume Ceph and how it's integrated into a lot of different projects. Um, I'm going to give it to Loic to do that. Um, before I do that, though, are there any sort of questions um, people have? Sure. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, how you handle bit drops? Yes. Um, so there are two things. So the main thing is that um, when, you, when you store data in the system, it's replicated, obviously. Um, in the background, we have um, what's called scrubbing. Um, where um, at, on a short interval, we just make sure that we have all the same objects in all, in all the right places. That's the shallow metadata scrubbing. And then on a slightly longer interval, by default it's two weeks, we'll actually read every object on every node and calculate checksums and compare them to make sure they are, they're still storing the exact same data. Um, there's also a new feature in Hammer where um, in certain cases, when the, client, when the object is actually written, we can also calculate the entire checksum and sort alongside. And when we do scrubbing, we record what that checksum is so that over time we can also determine when it's changed and we'll know which replica is the one that went wrong, not just that they're different. Um, do you need yes. Sorry, the question is? Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes. So the question is, if we have two replicas, do we need the checksumming? Um, yes, so you can do checksumming no matter how many replicas you have. Um, yeah, yeah, you can have anywhere from two to ten. Or you can actually have one replica, although it's not a very good idea. Um, with erasure coding, actually, there's also always a checksum stored, always, because it's sort of more immutable data <laughs> the way that those pools work. Yes? Sorry, could you repeat it? Uh, so the question is whether InfiniBand is only um, inside the cluster or also to the clients. Um, and, it's, and it's both. Um, so the way that it's, it's currently structured, it, the, the messenger abstraction is totally general. It can be used, used both between nodes and to clients. Eventually, we'll want to have that um, configurable so that you can have, for example, a, a TCP facing the clients and an InfiniBand internally. Um, but for now, it's, 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 it's pretty preliminary and pretty simple. 
We'll also eventually want to be able to make it so you can have dual protocol support in the same cluster, um, but that's also sort of further, further down the line. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, so CephFS is always the, the question that comes up. So just a little bit of history. CephFS is where Ceph started. It was created as a distributed POSIX file system. And as part of architecting that, we built an object layer that turned out to be really useful for building all this other stuff. Um, and then sort of as um, Ceph sort of grew up and we started to deploy it in production, um, it turns out that the, the lower layers, layers were much simpler and easier to sort of harden and productize. And so that's what... Um, we focused on as far as sort of bringing Ceph to market as a product and all that stuff. And so unfortunately, Ceph, FFS, the, the sort of the original goal and the most complicated part of the system has been sort of the last part to become, become stable and tested. Um, so it's, um, let's see. So the first question is, why is it, why do we say it's not production ready? Um, it's actually been used by lots of people in lots of different environments for a long time. Um, and there's sort of no known um, terrible bugs that are going to eat your data. The real problem is that we just don't have enough experience of seeing it in production to have the confidence as sort of a company supporting the product to know that it's not going to eat your data. So this is true as Ink Tank and is a doubly true of Red Hat is even more conservative about their, their product statements. Um, and I think that the biggest sort of thing that, that comes down to right now is that um, if you do hit a bug and if you do have some corruption or something, we don't have a, a, a FS check tool that is going to necessarily repair all of your, all of your data. Um, that's changing, actually, very quickly. So the, the current focus of all the CFS developers right now is on building these um, recovery and check tools. Um, so there are two, two paths, two things that we're working on. One is um, scrubbing so that we can check the consistency of what you're storing and all the metadata structures to make sure they're correct. That didn't quite make the hammer time frame. But the other piece is having sort of recovery tools that sort of scavenge all of your metadata and try to rebuild things. Um, parts of that have made it in but we still don't have sort of a comprehensive repair tool if you run into trouble. Um, so we, we recommend it for any um, data that is not <laughs> um, critical because we don't want to be responsible if you lose data. Um, and, in the, in those, and we'd be very interested in hearing what, what people see. Um, but because there's no FS check, it's, it makes us nervous to say, go, out, go forth and run this with your, your critical data. So hopefully that clears things up some. Yes? Uh, yes. What is the maximum okay, so the, the question is about geo-replication, what's supported now and what will be supported in the future. Um, today there are sort of, there are a couple different ways you can look at it. Um, in general, Ceph is designed to run on low latency networks. It was originally intended for a single data center. Um, there are lots of people who run it in multiple data centers that have low latency links. So in Europe, for example, you can have data centers on opposite ends of the country that still are pretty close together. Um, and so there are people who do that and have you know, block devices that are distributed in that fashion. So I wouldn't really call that geo-replication, though, because it's, it's low latency. Um, so for, sort of proper, in order, for proper asynchronous replication, there are sort of a couple things that you can do. Um, for the RADIUS gateway solution, which is the RESTful object storage, there is like a full-blown um, support for multiple regions, federated clusters across multiple data centers. Um, and the model here is targeting roughly what Amazon S3 does, where you have you know, US East, US West, Singapore, Europe, whatever. And so you can create a bucket in a particular location. And it's a single federated user namespace and bucket namespace that sort of will direct traffic to the right data center where your data is. Um, the thing that we do on top of that is we also um, give you um, a rep asynchronous replication across those regions. So you can say that everything in this particular data center gets replicated to that data center asynchronously. Um, and that's all there that's been there since Firefly and is sort of improving as time goes on. Um, but for the, for the block device and for the file system, there isn't sort of a proper geo-replication solution yet. Um, the goal is, um, with a lot of the refactoring that we're doing in RBD, is to create an asynchronous mirroring feature for the block devices um, so that you can have sort of a, an asynchronous replica that's fully time consistent but is, you know, a few minutes old or whatever it ends up being um, in another data center for disaster recovery purposes. Um, that's not there yet, but it's sort of the next thing on the roadmap. Um, and then sort of further out, what we want to do is have an a asynchronous mirroring feature for entire RADOS pools so that you can have, take your entire cluster, essentially, and have a fully consistent 
copy in another data center. But that's a much more challenging research problem that we're, we're sort of working on right now, so that's also, also further out because it turns out that having a point in time copy in something that's distributed when you can't really fully synchronize the clocks for various reasons of physics and practicality um, is, is a little challenging, so. Yes? Um, the question is, does Ceph provide guarantees about data integrity? Um, yes and no. Um, it's, it's sort of an evolving story. So as I said, it, Ceph always aims for a strong consistency. So the idea is that a, a Rados pool is consisted of, consists of lots of different servers that are replicating and distributing and so forth. But from the application's perspective, it looks like a single copy. So you have strict read after write consistency. Um, as far as data, data integrity goes, um, for erasure-coded pools, um, everything is always checksummed as it enters the system, and those checksums are validated as the data comes back, back out. Um, so you're sort of always going to get the right bits. Um, for replicated pools, um, the checksumming is more um, opportunistic because you, you have small overwrites, and we don't store everything for every block. And so you don't always get the full checksums unless you're reading and writing the whole object. That's why you have the background scrubbing that will go back in and find the bit rot as it happens later and then sort of repair then. Um, Yes. You say the new big release is coming up in March. Mm -hmm. it, it will be possible to upgrade the uh, production. Yes. So the, um, Hammer is coming out in March. The question is whether you can upgrade in production. And the answer is yes. So from, I think, the since the beginning, actually, from A, with the A release to the B release, we've always um, provided for online upgrades of a, of a cluster that's in production to the, to the new version. So that means that if you have you know, 1,000 servers participating in the cluster, you can upgrade one at a time or all of them at a time or whatever, and whatever you want to do. And while the system is continuously available, and there's all sorts of versioning and feature checks and all that stuff to make sure that always works. And that's something that we, we test um, thoroughly, I guess, <laughs> I should say, um, to make sure it works. Um, yeah. OK, so let's sort of switch gears. I'll give the mic to, to Loic, and we're going to talk about all the different things that sort of are built on top of Ceph and integrate with Ceph so you can store, <coughs> store data. Hey, um, we have 10 minutes, so that's fairly short. Yeah, but that, that was interesting. So the, the, the idea, uh, ideally, uh, there is here a bunch of developers who are interested in using Ceph in new ways in the context of uh, an infrastructure as a service um, framework, like OpenStack or Docker, although some people say, hmm, Docker is not quite, but yeah. Or Proxmox or CloudStack. Uh, we've seen all these features, they are new, and uh, the idea is I will go uh, through each um, infrastructure as a service context and see what's currently, sorry, yeah, what's currently in and what could be in the future what is cooking. So for each of them, I'm not a specialist. I mean, I'm a Ceph developer. I write code in Ceph. I do use OpenStack. That's why I put it in first. Um, I have a personal OpenStack cluster on which my mail is hosted, and I use Ceph. So uh, I, I know what I'm into. But I'm very conservative. I'm not a very uh, a system administrator that goes to run the latest version always. I'm actually running Dumpling. So we are currently in Giant. There was Firefly before that, Emperor before that. I'm running Dumpling. The parts I use are in OpenStack, you have Cinder, which is the thing that manages disks that gives the virtual machine something to work on. And there is also Glance, where you have a library of images from which you create the disk, and then you boot on. But uh, the operating system comes from this library of images. And then you have Nova, uh, which manage, uh, for instance, KVM. That's what I use. It has to be somewhat aware of uh, Ceph, because it needs to connect uh, directly KVM to Ceph. It's not like uh, it's using a QCO2 file on the file system locally that turns out to be uh, Ceph. It's not transparent to uh, the thing that manages the virtual machine. 
And then there is something that I don't actually use, uh, Swift and S3, the object store. Uh, but maybe some people use OpenStack and Ceph already. Who does? So do you have, yeah. Uh, do you have something to add to what you're using currently with Ceph? Yes. I'm yes. I'm using currently, okay, I'm doing consulting on OpenStack uh, as well, so I'm having uh, a couple of projects on OpenStack. So you're doing consulting on OpenStack and you have a few clients who run OpenStack yeah, and Ceph? Both use Cinder and S3. Yes. Yeah, okay. And I'd also like to have some feedback if you want to. This is and you would like feedback practice, yeah. about the best practices. But do you, do you actually develop new features? No. In, uh, Is there anyone who committed a patch somewhere in OpenStack and well, Ceph, maybe? Sort of. Yeah? Small one. A small one, cool. Okay, we have five minutes. <laughs> that will be short. So we are lucky to have here Josh, who is actually working. You didn't raise your hand, or I didn't see you. But, uh, can you stand up, maybe, so people know and can ask you a question later? Yeah, face. Is, uh, is the guy working full time on RBD and knows uh, OpenStack integration? So um, he, he cannot do all the job, but he can tell you more than I could ever. Uh, what's, today I asked uh, someone what, the, what they would like to see in OpenStack in the future. And they said that RBD snapshot should be used instead of uh, QMU snapshot. So the, the idea is that when you want a snapshot, if you ask QMU, it will do a copy of the data, am I right? Which is uh, time consuming and also uses a lot of network. Instead, uh, we could use the ability of Ceph to do the snapshotting. So it will be a lot faster because uh, Ceph has this ability of doing the copy and write. Uh, so it does not do, uh, have to do all the copy, actually. This is also uh, an example for me this is a basic feature. It, it's not new in Giant. It has been here for quite a long time. But it's the time it takes for a feature from a new uh, distributed uh, storage to make it to the upper levels, to the levels where me, uh, user of OpenStack, I, I would be able to see the difference. It would be user facing. The other thing is uh, Cinder volume migration and uh, enabling live backup for Cinder backup. Uh, okay, so I will uh, I will not go into details for that for these ones. Um, I will skip the cloud stack thing. Uh, is there? Yeah. Sure. Well, no. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like these features, they are, and there are blueprints for that. So the, the question was, are you targeting Kilo feature, uh, the next OpenStack release? So these features are not being actively worked on currently, so it's in the wish list. It will probably be uh, after the Kilo release, and unless, Josh, you have more information. But this is, uh, yeah, something we would like to see, we could see. And, um, yeah. So I will, uh, uh, another question maybe about OpenStack, no? We have two minutes left? Yeah? All right. I will shortly talk about Docker. Uh, so I started using Docker um, maybe a year ago. Oh, sorry, I was looking at, yeah. Um, I, I started using Docker maybe a year ago and uh, there are three types of um, disk space that are consumed by Docker. When you boot a container, it uses um, something that comes from, let's say, DevMapper. It's the root file system. It's supposed to be volatile. 
So this uh, is probably not interesting to, to use with Ceph, although some people try uh, to do that. And there is the image, the Docker image, which you pull from a repository which someone did or you built, but it's also it's generated. So it, there is no point in storing it in Ceph in order to make it permanent because, well, you can always rebuild it. And then there is what Docker calls the volumes, where you're supposed to store the data that is permanently, permanently uh, available. So what I would like to see in Docker future is just a use for dash dash volume to designate a RBD volume instead of just a path in the file system. So that shortly covers OpenStack and Docker, and uh, we're out of time. So thank you very much all for coming, and I hope we will develop Ceph together in the future.